Here you can see the Swan Coastal Plain and the Darling Scarp. I think you could say that for a long time we always thought the Darling Scarp was richer in flora than the plain because it was flat and uninteresting. Many places around Western Australia have this huge diversity of plants and animals and they're all of interest, but the Swan Coastal Plain is particularly diverse and is particularly diverse where it meets the Darling Scarp. Okay, can you tell me where I am? Okay, tell me where I am now, please. How many people knew that was Rotnest? Because that means that you know some of the plant communities of Rotnest, but still not every one of you did. Compared, not as many as knew the, the built heritage as the natural heritage. And that is the, that's the sort of key point I want to make today. Our natural heritage is far more diverse, long history, you know, millions of years. Plants in that picture, some of them are probably hundreds and hundreds of years old. Even the shrubs and the sedges may be that. We don't know these things. But every time we destroy something like this, we're destroying eons of history of our state. Now, I happened to meet a guy not long ago who told me about the proposal to make the golf course on Rottnest Island a green golf course. Many people have celebrated that they have a dry golf course and the whole concept in our shortage of water to set up a green golf course to attract golfers to Rottnest seems entirely sad, but epitomises a lot of the approaches in this state now where we, we promote such activities over our wonderful natural heritage. Now, whether it will influence these wetlands, which this is a wetland community or not, I don't know how well it'll be investigated. But the quote I've got below is not mine. It was a quote from a group of people who were despairing because of the lack of funding for writers' programs. And the question was, are the barbarians, no, he said, the barbarians are in charge of Boomtown because we're spending money, uh, huge amounts of money, on things like roads to make them marginally safer. I would argue that education programs on things such as our bushland and roads would do more for road safety than any of the sorts of improvements that we have. And if people truly knew and understood and loved our bushland as they should, then we would spend more money on it. So what we urgently need is such education programs. Now, the discussion focused on the urban bushland strategy. And you can see the Urban Bushland Council was there. Remember, pre-digital age, this is a black and white document. I was approached at that workshop, I gave a talk, um, and I was approached by the staff at the Department of Environmental Protection about whether I was in interested in working on the update of System 6. This picture, which was in Bush Forever and Perth Bush Plan, is taken from Hepburn Heights. So you can see there were a series of bushland areas that the battle, and you could call it a battle to protect them, was pivotal in the government actually moving towards a world-class project. It was quite controversial at the time. One of the saddest things I heard was one of the people that was there when the bush, the bulldozers were there, and she said they were squashing kangaroos. That people can see, but the thousands and thousands of plants were also going. The sort of beginning of Perth Bush Plan and Bush Forever, and for now I'm just gonna call it the Bush Forever Project, okay? That's what I do in the paper I did. It started with the System 6 proposals because really it was an update of System 6. It began as in the EPA, but there were parallel programs in a whole series of other places to look at urban bushland itself. Now, my job that I got was with the EPA because they had a key role in conservation planning at that point. And though it, most of the proposals for development they had to look at at that period, 1994, when I was taken on, was we're on development within the greater Perth area. Now, this brown thing is the Swan Coastal Plain, that's the Ibra region that Greg talked about, the red boundary is System 6, but for the System 6 update, we added on this little bit of System 1. So it covered the whole of the Swan Coastal Plain to the Moore River. There's still a bit to the north that's not been looked at in the same way. The forest bit 
wasn't done because the RFA process had dealt with that to a greater extent. So the EPA had a large role in conservation planning at that point. And in this area, not only because of the development proposals, but also because that it, what was calm at that stage wasn't interested so much in urban bushland. Small reserves were not wanted. In fact, I remember commenting on a couple of small reserves that were being suggested and being given to local government, a couple of little nature reserves, because of the difficulty of managing them and a whole series of things like that. But they've all got threatened, the ones that they most of the small reserves have threatened ecological communities in and now the Department of Environment and Conservation is very interested in those and were by the end of the Bush Forever project, in fact more into the Bush Forever project. Okay, so I worked with what was then the Department of Environmental Protection. We had a series of groups, this is the group that was there when we were doing Bush Forever. So there's me. I'm for left government. There's Gary Wilson, he's left government. Karen's with DEC, so um, Sandra's with um, Syrinx. John and Bridget are still within the same group. But the Environmental Protection Authority is no longer being a major player in conservation planning. This slide is from the front of both the volume ones of Bush Plan and Bush Forever just to illustrate the amount of cooperation we had. The F Bush Plan came out signed off by all of the chairs of the, the body that overlooks the government departments as such. So we've got the West Australian Planning Commission, the EPA, the National Parks and Nature Conservation Authority, which is now um, the Conservation Commission, and the Water and Rivers Commission, which I believe still exists. No, okay, all right. <laughs> the top three still exist. Bush Forever was signed off by the ministers of the day. And just to show you how different it is now, Cheryl Edwards knew me by name. She would come up to me, I can remember her coming up to me at a function and saying, Bronwyn, it was a seven o'clock function, we're going to meet the people at the Perth airport at so-and-so time. I want, I, you're, uh, you're coming, I see with me, but I've decided that we, you also should have the um, head of the EPA, not the head of the EPA, the head of the Department of Environmental Protection as well. So I don't think now there is the same interest in Bush Forever. This is the launch of Bush Forever. There were hundreds of guests. We celebrated the launch of Bush Plan. Bush Forever was a pri the launch of Bush Forever was a private gathering. So this change in the profile of protecting bushland has been going for a long time. So we didn't celebrate the launch of Bush Forever, but we did put an application into the Premier's Awards, which is a public sector award, and we won the Sustainable Environment. Now, if you look at who was there, the Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Planning and Infrastructure and Waters and Rivers Commission, you think, where's CALM? But because CALM sponsored this award, they didn't feel they could be on the people nominating it. So that's why, because they're really there. But if you look at these people again, there's Bridget and John, but none of the others to my knowledge, are still working within the system in Western Australia. This man was um, in charge of the department, well, by this time we were the department of Juicy P, it was called at that point. This man didn't even actually know what Bush Forever was when he had to get up to, to um, take the award. So that was, that's what happened over that period of time. And a lot of it, I think, was to do with the huge change in departments. As we changed government, they'd change a the department. So they sort of separated the expertise and we had built a strong team. We did have very vigorous debate and at times it, it damaged people, but the goodwill was there and the commitment to this plan to get it produced. Okay, so let's go into sort of some of the, the more of the technical side of it. You need to remember that the focus, we had a set of criteria. Now these criteria are based on the 
criteria that the um, Heritage Commission had for registering places of national significance. It doesn't exist anymore, but they were fantastic criteria. If you can get a copy of them, please do. They're in the libraries, but you won't get them digitally, generally. We had six biological criteria. The focus was on common plant communities and flora, followed by the rare, and they were a set of areas. They couldn't generally stand alone. So every time we don't implement one, the whole plan has a great loss. We had a planning criterion as well. We had to have that. People like me had to observe it. We wouldn't have got a whole series of places if that hadn't been done. We worked on what my director at the time told me that I should follow was the 80-20 rule. You needed to give up 20% to get the 80%. That isn't how I work normally, but it was needed to be done. There were several developers who's, who put their, almost their fist on the table and said this project will never come out. And as you saw, it was signed off by the three ministers. Okay, so here's the plan. The plan focused on the values the natural values in a systematic process. It was a plan. We planned for areas across the plain. Not, we recognised that sand dunes had value, even though we focused on bushland, because by focusing on bushland, we had higher quality vegetation, which meant that we got the best we could get at the time. But this is bushland. That's all the plants that ever grew there. We also included we, even though as extras, bare ground and rock and open water. Okay, so we had the policy document and the implementation document were volume ones of both Bush, of Perth's Bush Plan was the policy document and Bush, in Bush Forever, it was the implement, volume one was the implementation plan. But what sat behind it was this rigorous data. Now there's a lot missing but I can't think of any protective measure or action that was lost by lack of technical information. Now, I'm not saying it's always available, but if you get the people with the knowledge to interpret the information, it's powerful. Okay, so we had 287 Bush Forever sites, 52,000 hectares, 18% of the Perth metropolitan region. The aim was 10%. We got less than 10% of some mappable units and more than 10% of others. But we have it backed up by this directory of Bush Forever sites, which came out for Perth's Bush Plan and for Bush Forever. At one stage, it wasn't going to be published. Perth's Bush Plan was going to come out a year earlier, but because there was a technical difficulty, I'll point out with what that was with in a minute, it was published, and in my opinion, even though I was the key author, <laughs> um, it was the, it's the strength of the project with the policies. It can back up the policies. Okay, it's big. It's got 600 pages, more than 500 published and unpublished references. You can't just look at published references, and particularly you can't just look on the net to find out things. You have to search for the data. We had all these files set up, they're now lodged in the Dex Science Library. And we standardised descriptions. So we did this systematic planning, and I'm just going to give you a quick movement across the plain to see the plant communities. All right, the technical difficulties had been with the mapping of the native vegetation. The whole thing changed over the time we were there, but when Bush Plan was going to come out, and we were getting a list of the people that were going to the private landholders because we did recognise private land, even though we tried public lands first. We found that the accuracy was too low and the Ag Department did it all again with much greater accuracy. We had one Bush Forever site that was totally Commonwealth land, but because of that slight slither, there were about 200 landholders, private landholders, 
picked up when you did the intersections. So it was really done without geographic information system backing that you have now. Please remember that because we spent a lot of time on one thing I'll show you because it was all done by typing the information in. Okay, so there's the mapping. If you look, this is um, the example I'm going to just show you quickly is Bullsbrook Nature Reserve and adjacent bushland. So the green line is the remnant vegetation mapping done by AG. It had some issues, like this turned out to be Tacosasti. So <laughs> we didn't put it in. But you can see the original area, the nature reserves, the black, but we added significant areas. This was local government land and that was private land. This is the description of this. This was a System 6 recommendation, but just the nature reserve. And that's the sort of description that System 6 had in it. And these are the maps. Now, these maps have only just recently been done in a correct fashion. And Gary Wisson had to do that before he left because he was the only person that actually really remembered the history of each of the System 6 areas in their maps. So what we did is we set up, and like I said, we typed all this in, even though it looks like it's generated from a database, it's not. We not only typed it in, but we also checked it all. We had the GIS system that we had, and we checked it all against known information. And this is only a little bit of the description, and it quite distresses me at times to see people doing work on Bush Forever areas and never having referred to the document. One document I looked at even did a floristic analysis of, of 10 by 10 metre sites, which is the sort of some of the key work I'll show you in a minute. They'd even done that again, even though we had sites in the area, and they got the wrong communities. In fact, they misidentified the major native tree species. Now that's pretty hard in my opinion. All right, vegetation complexes were mapped, so they were used for at least 10%. You can see there's two in this Bullsbrook Bush Forever site, but we also did these 10 by 10 metre areas, which give you, in a lot of areas, we tried, we, what we were doing was setting up enough to be a framework across the plain. Because the original study, like I said, was from Moore River to Dunsborough, and it was called the System 6 update. The community was heavily involved in this. You can see how long it was going on for. This one was done in about 1991. All of those people have passed on. This is Margot O'Byrne, and I think two, and only two of those people are still with us. But they were point-based studies which gave us real information. We've published Bush Plan and Bush Forever. It has the results of the System 6 update in it in a summary fashion, but only a portion of the supplement, that work, which was supplementary to this, is available. The programs have been curtailed through lack of finance. So who knows what's going to happen to that data that was collected between 1994 and 2012. Okay, so here's Bullsbrook Nature Reserve, and this is what it actually looks like on the ground. We looked at it as part of this study. There's lots of different wetlands in it. There's Bankshire woodland and Jarrow woodland, and a series of threatened ecological communities. Wetlands was another thing we took into account. And one of the things I meant to say earlier is we were privileged in the work to have three experts employed on the study. We had myself, who had been active in this floristic work. We had Alan Hill, who I'm pleased to see here, from the Water and Rivers Commission, who with the wetland mapping. And we had John Dell with his wealth of knowledge from on fauna. Now he worked on the program in the beginning from the museum, but later came to the Department of Environmental Protection. Okay, so there's the mapped wetlands. So we had this huge resource available to us. We weren't able to support, to preserve all conservation category wetlands, but Alan and I went through the maps, wetland by wetland, and changed the boundaries to make sure that we could include as much as possible. Okay, flora, we looked at individual species. We have a wealth of information. This is a fitting motto, um, emblem for this conference because Bankshire means easy eye woodlands are really focused and at their richest in the Perth metropolitan region. We have rare species that only grow 
in the Perth metropolitan region. This is Conospermum undulatum. This one in the background and this are both species that make Hawkvale bushland particularly special. From this um, quadrat based data, this 10 by 10 metre data, we were a, we have a series of threatened ecological communities were recognised, and this is the one in Hawkvale Bushland. So I mentioned John Dell. We did have fauna data. There'd been a series of studies carried out on a whole of, lot of the bushland patches we had looked at. I was, this was if I had time. <laughs> this was talk to talk to you about the Greater Brixton Street wetlands. And what an achievement that was, because EPA had made decisions on half of the area, on a series of places in the area. We were able to, with working with the Department of Planning and Infrastructure, to recognise and protect through a, a, a planning control area, areas that had already been approved for development. Okay, this is really what I will finish with. Urban bushland needs informed friends and lovers. Every person in Perth should be a friend of the bushland. Many of us love it. It's just, part of, it's just part of us and part of being. They need management the sites by informed people because this is a sign that Greg took a picture of many years ago at Star Swamp and you can see the diversity of European impacts on this bushland. So I thank all the people that helped with this production and I thank you for listening.